My name is Narayan Rangaraj from the Industrial Engineering and Operations Group, Operations Research Group at IIT Bombay. And uh, some part of the introductory notes are uh, uh, also due to Professor Subnish from uh, Mathematics Department. So you have already seen this, uh, this idea of confidence intervals which tell you uh, in some precise probabilistic language how likely a parameter is likely to be, uh, is going to be in a certain interval. So that is when you are asked to give a range for, uh, for a given parameter that you are trying to estimate. So supposing you want to estimate the number of defectives in a, in a total population and based on a sample you have to conclude something. You cannot say for sure because the, uh, the defective phenomenon is probabilistic. So you can give a range and uh, the larger the range, the more likely the parameter is likely is going to be in it. So you can give a very large range, but that is not very useful. So you want to give a tight, tight range, but which contains the parameter of interest with, with high probability. That is the best that you can do. So confidence intervals you have already seen. But uh, sometimes you want to ask the reverse question. Uh, you, you don't want the, the statistician or the experimental uh, investigator or the scientist or, or the engineer to, to give a range of values. You, uh, you have a hypothesis or you have a proposition and the analyst is supposed to either agree or disagree with it. So you as the user have a, have a hypothesis and uh, the, the role of the analyst is to either agree or disagree with it. So the simplest example of course is, is like a court where uh, a person is either guilty or innocent and uh, some judge or jury has to agree or disagree with that. That, that, is the, uh, that is the simplest example of hypothesis testing where uh, the role of the analyst is to give an opinion yes or no, not give a range of values and things like that, but give an opinion uh, yes or no. So on, on what statistical basis do we do this? So that is the uh, topic of hypothesis testing. So actually the material is, is straightforward. It is the first few sections of ROS. Uh, we'll, we'll see how far we can go in, in this lecture and the next one. So that is what we will, we will do. So hypothesis testing, this is what I plan to do, introduction and motivation. A notion of significance levels, uh, which is a way of saying how confident we are of our hypothesis uh, test. So when we agree or disagree, then uh, with, with what probability are we sure of uh, doing that? Uh, so the, there is a well-known uh, terminology used in hypothesis testing. There's type one and type two errors. We'll quickly see that. And specifically, we'll, we'll apply the concept of hypothesis testing to normal populations. You know, because of the central limit theorem, we know that uh, many interesting uh, phenomenon can be assumed to have an appropriately chosen normal distribution. So testing for means or variances of those normal populations is, is one uh, uh, important area in hypothesis testing. We'll also see it for binomial probabilities, for populations. So uh, let's quickly start with the introduction. So given, given some data, how likely is it that the data has arisen from some hypothesis distribution? So we'll, uh, we'll answer this question more precisely later on, but this is the type of uh, question. So. So for example, if a manufacturer claims that some, some parameter has an average value m, then do we accept that? So if uh, somebody says that, you know, the lifetime of uh, uh, some bulb is so many hours, but, you know, inherently the, 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 the performance of the bulb is, the, is a probabilistic one. So if we just look at some data, how do we accept or, or not accept? The, the manufacturers claim that the average is indeed so and so. So as you can imagine, if we assume that in this case that the parameter is normally distributed, we can draw some random samples and uh, you know it's very unlikely that all the values will be equal to whatever the manufacturer is claiming. Some of them will be more, some will be less. 
for example if all of them are less than what he claims then you know we are we are unlikely to believe his uh, his claim so some will be more some will be less so with what confidence do we accept the manufacturer's claim that the mean is indeed so and so so in most in most practical situations there will be some physical meaning to the uh, to the claim so for example in the in the lifetime uh, claim so if the manufacturer claims that the life of this bulb is 1000 hours then uh, you know, if it turns out that the life is actually 1,200 hours on average, then we are quite happy about it. So, what we are really testing is whether the whether the mean is 1,000 hours or more. So, we are okay with uh, you know an increase on one side. So, that is the type of thing which we would like to test through through some data. So, here are qu some quick examples. Say, a medical researcher may want to decide on the basis of some experimental evidence whether coffee drinking increases the risk of cancer in in humans. So this is the type of thing where, you know, the expert has to give an opinion. So if, if there are two kinds of measurement gauges in the market, then an engineer may have to decide on the basis of some sample data whether there is any difference between the accuracy of the two. So this is the type of uh, question that is asked in hypothesis testing, which uh, we would like to try to answer. So you have seen the concept of random variables and independent random variables when you are talking about say about pairs of random variables. So independence test. So if you look at data then is there a dependence between a person's blood type and eye color. Suppose this is the experiment or the investigation and some data is collected on, on uh, these two attributes and our question is someone says that these two things are independent random variables. So do we say yes or no on, on the basis of the observed data? So this is the type of example that I told you that a construction firm has bought a large number of cables and uh, the claim of the manufacturer is that the cables have an av average breaking strength of something, 7000 PSI. So wh what this means is that the breaking strength on average is 7000 PSI or more. So do we accept this? So in each of these cases, you know, there's a conjecture about the system or the population and uh, we have to decide, we have to determine this conjecture based on some sample data. So it is very similar to what you did in construction of confidence interval but the way the question is posed is slightly different. So a statistical hypothesis is an assertion or conjecture, conjecture con concerning one or more populations and uh, in the language of hypothesis testing two complementary hypotheses come to mind. Either the assertion is true or it is false. So uh, some people use H and H dash, H for the assertion is true and H dash for H assertion is false. So we have two choices, either we can reject H dash and conclude that H is strongly supported by the data or we can fail to reject H dash and conclude that H is not strongly supported by the data. So you know. For example, supposing someone claims that I have developed a better vaccine than what is there in the market for, for some disease. So you might uh, want to say, so where is the evidence of that? So you look at treatment data for, for the two, two vaccines and uh, then uh, you have to conclude whether there is enough evidence to overthrow the existing uh, treatment. and. Uh, whether to accept the new treatment. Now the data that you have on these things are, are sample data arising from some inherently probabilistic phenomenon. So you cannot say for sure, but based on the evidence you would like to, uh, you have to say something. I mean you, you cannot just say I don't know. Uh, so, so in the language of hypothesis testing, so just to contrast, so supposing we put a mathematical proposition as opposed to a statistical proposition. So mathematical proposition is that fx say some function uh, is of this type, some function has a minimum. So this is either true or false, so there is no, there is no ambiguity about this. So you can, you can verify this by whatever means. But statistical hypotheses are different in nature. So, so statistical hypothesis, so people are, are uh, competing. I mean two, two products are competing and the marketing uh, uh, analyst has, has made a claim that the proportion of consumers preferring brand A to brand B is 
0.4. That is, uh, uh, forty percent of the consumers prefer brandy. Okay, so this is the this is the hypothesis. Now you can interpret this in, in in a number of ways. One of the ways is that if you if you draw a random consumer, then that person is is likely to prefer brandy to brand B with probability 0.4. Or if you pick a large number of people and and ask them all which they prefer, then about forty percent of them are likely to say I prefer brandy to brand B. So this is the hypothesis. So supposing we actually now start doing this. So I picked. 12, 15 customers and 12 of them are found to prefer, prefer brand A to brand B. So it looks like a large number of them prefer brand A to brand B. So this, this hypothesis that 0.4 of them, I mean 0.4 fraction prefer brand A to brand B, it looks a bit odd because 12 out of 15 uh, prefer brand A to brand B. Uh, but from your uh, knowledge of uh, binomial distributions, uh, supposing I randomly pick 15 people from the population, is it possible that 12 out of them prefer brand A to brand B given that each individual is likely to prefer brand A to brand B with, with probability 0.4. So is this possible? So did you get the question that uh, each, each customer prefers brand A to brand B with probability 0.4. I, I got 15 persons in a room and asked them and uh, 12 of them happened to prefer brand A to brand B. So is this possible? It is certainly possible, but you know you can, you can work out that it is quite unlikely. It is certainly possible because you know you can work out the probability that 12 people uh, prefer brand A to brand B given that each one will prefer brand A to brand B with probability 0.4. So you can actually work it out, but as of now it seems unlikely. So we would like to say that it is it's highly unlikely that the statistical hypothesis is true. So we would like to uh, make this conclusion. So, but supposing I say that, uh, you know, 10 people preferred, then you say that is also unlikely, but certainly more likely than 12 people. Uh, what about 8 out of 15? Possible, definitely possible. 7 out of 15, very, very possible, you know. So at some, at some place we have to we have to draw the line saying that uh, this this looks okay 0 0.4 seems uh, seems okay. So of course if exactly 40 percent of the people that you sir, you sampled turned out to like prefer brand A to brand B, then you say yeah it looks it looks possible that the the real the real fraction is 0 0.4. But if I got something too low, so if I if I got zero people out of 15 preferring brand A to brand B, then you would be suspicious of the statement that 0.4 is the fraction. If I got 15 on 15, you would be suspicious. But somewhere in the, in the middle, you would, you would be okay with it. So what is that middle region where you would be okay with it? So that, that's the type of question that we will, we will uh, ask in. So for example here, if the true probability, we, which we don't know, but that is the claim. In this case, that is the claim made by somebody. If, if the true probability is 0.4, then the probability of observing 12 or more successes in 15 trials is 0 0.002. It is from that binomial calculation. Each one, so it's like tossing a coin 15 times. The probability of heads is, is 0.4, and I got 12 heads out of 15. So what is the probability of that? So you can work it out, right? I hope you can work it out. So if you think about it, you can. So it is physically possible, so it's not impossible. So I cannot reject the hypothesis uh, totally, but it's highly unlikely. So the the way that uh, the statistician would like to uh, pose his conclusion is to give a level of significance. So so before that. Uh, similar uh, uh, language for, for an example which I will follow through now using some numerical uh, value. So for example, supposing the cure rate for a di given disease using standard medication 60 percent. Then a new drug is, is anticipated which somebody says has better medication, med medication properties than the standard one. Now the new drug is to be tried on a sample of 20 patients and the number cured X 
in the 20 is to be recorded. So this is the way we will, we will uh, go about the investigation to see whether the new drug is indeed more effective than the old drug. So supposing 12 out of those 20 turned out to be okay, then you know it's, it's about the same as the old drug. So we want something significantly better than that. So is there substantial evidence that the new drug has a higher cure rate than the standard medication? So society is generally conservative and uh, you know we require strong evidence to overthrow status quo. Uh, so generally people are comfortable wherever they are or they have got used to it. So to overthrow something which is established you require strong evidence. Because one thing is it, it, it has a cost to go over to a new thing. So you don't want to do it uh, just very, very casually. You, you want enough evidence that something is really better. Otherwise it's not worth it. So this is a conservative way of putting it. I'm not saying that we should be that way, but uh, uh, sometimes it appears like that. So now here the relevant hypothesis is that the new drug is better than the standard medication. That is the P, the success rate of the new drug is greater than 0.6. And the, the reverse of that is that it is not better than the, than the standard medication. P is less than or equal to 0.6. So this is the language used in hypothesis testing. There is something called the null hypothesis and something called the alternative hypothesis. Uh, I, I will try to find out why, why this term null and alternative is used, why null hypothesis, but that is the, it is usually used for the status quo that uh, you are where you are and the, the opposite of that is the alternative hypothesis. So of the complementary statements concerning the unknown state of nature, in this case the effectiveness of the new drug. One is called the null hypothesis and the other is called the alternative hypothesis. So in this case, uh, you know the choice of what to call the null hypothesis and what to call the alternative, so, so we, we accept both the possibilities initially and then we want evidence regarding one of them and the way it is posed is that one of them is taken as the null hypothesis and you look if there is enough evidence to overturn the null hypothesis or to reject the null hypothesis. You can as well do it the other way around, but the implications are slightly different in terms of your perception and uh, the way people look at it. For example, in a court of law, you can assume the person is innocent and it is up to the prosecution to prove that the person is guilty. So if there is not enough evidence, then you, you say that I have no evidence to say that the person is guilty, so I continue to believe that he is innocent. Okay. You can say, you can start the proceedings the other way around. The, the person assumed to be guilty and it is the duty of the defense to prove that or to, to overturn that assumption. You can't prove anything in, in these statistical things. You can only give enough evidence to believe one way or another because from the type of example that we have seen, we cannot be absolutely sure. So even, even if, for example, even, in the, if, even if the new drug is indeed has a success rate of 80 percent, if I, if I draw a sample of 20 people, by bad luck I may, I may just pick a lot of people who did, who, who did not respond to the treatment. Even though the average, I mean the, the probability of responding is 80 percent, I may, by, by, by bad luck I may pick, you know, out of 20 people, 15 people didn't respond to the treatment. That can happen. With a very low probability can, it can happen. So the data shows that, you know, the sample proportion is only point, point, uh, point 0.25, whereas the real proportion is point 0.8, right? That can happen. So if I look at that data, then I will, be re I will not be accepting the, the, that, uh, the hypothesis that the new drug is better. So I will have made a mistake. That, that can happen, okay? So in hypothesis testing, we, we will make mistakes. The only thing is we want to put a probabilistic bound on those mistakes. So as I said, the, the choice of what to call the null hypothesis and what to call the alternate hypothesis is a matter of convention. So in, in courts of law often the null hypothesis is the person is innocent and the alternative hypothesis which can be accepted only with enough evidence to overturn the null hypothesis. Otherwise you say that the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. Is that okay? So uh, that's uh, you know, innocent until proven guilty. That is uh, the way uh, many courts op uh, uh, operate. So, the, for example, the consequences of wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis. That means 
if you wrongly convict somebody, that is a very bad thing. I mean, that is what we feel. So, supposing you, uh, I mean, this is a matter of opinion and convention between between us. So, supposing I say that uh, I wrongly convict somebody and punish, uh, then you know later on we find out that actually we had made a mistake. So, that is one type of error which we can make. The other type of error which we can make is we wrongly conclude that the person is innocent and do not punish. Actually, the person is guilty, but we do not punish. That is also a mistake. But we may say that the, the first mistake is a more serious one because an innocent person was was punished. So, for example, in extreme cases, supposing you know you you hang a person who is innocent, then there is no way of even compensating that that mistake. Or you know, if you if you impose a severe penalty, then uh, you know there is no way of retrieving that uh, that loss. Whereas the other way around, that is somebody who should have gone to jail or who should have been hanged as per the laws of the country was not hanged, that is also a blot on the justice system, but that is a less serious error. Is, is that okay? So, there is a difference between the two types of mistakes. So, depending on which one we view as more serious, we, we appropriately define the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So, the, the convention is that wrongly overturning the null hypothesis is a more serious error than wrongly accepting the null hypothesis okay so that is where this type 1 and type 2 error come in which we will we'll, we'll talk about so choice of so the null hypothesis is called h0 and the alternative hypothesis is called h1 so i told you that either h and h dash or h0 and h1 so in this uh, terminology when an investigation is aimed at establishing an assertion with substantive support obtained from the sample the negation of that assertion is taken as the null hypothesis and the assertion is taken as the alternative. So, you, when you want to make a new, new claim, then that is put as the alternative. Status quo is often the null hypothesis. So, before claiming that a statement is valid, adequate evidence must be produced to support it. So, if I, if I want to establish that a person is, is likely to be guilty, then I have to give adequate evidence for it. Otherwise, you say that you, you will stick with the null hypothesis. So, the null hypothesis should be regarded as true and should be rejected only when the data strongly testify against it. Okay. So, this is what I said that, uh, so in a sense the, the purpose of the hearing is to see whether there is enough evidence to establish the guilt. Okay. If there is not enough evidence then you, you do not conclude that he is guilty you do not you do not actually prove that the person is innocent or something that is not the purpose of the the trial the purpose of the trial is to see if there is enough evidence to convict okay so technically i suppose you should you should conclude at the end of a trial that he was found not guilty you don't say he was found innocent or something you say he was found not guilty that is there is no evidence to conclude that he is guilty so therefore he is not guilty at the moment the other way around, so if you start with assuming that he is guilty and then you try to say that he is innocent, then you conclude that the person is innocent. So, this is just a question of language, but you can see the way the, the consequences that I, that I have uh, uh, said. So, I, I believe in, in, in Scotland or something, they have this, uh, this third, third verdict of not proven. So, you know, you say that there is not enough evidence to conclude that the person is guilty and in some cases there is not enough evidence the other way also that is if you start with the assumption that he is guilty there is not enough, give, enough evidence to prove that the person is innocent also. So, you sort of leave the person in, in, in limbo in sort of in between and say that not proven and that can also be very damaging I mean that is uh, it is like uh, it, it depends on, on, on how society views these things. So, at least in the old days the Scottish courts used to you give this verdict of not proven that is we sort of we tend to believe that the person may be guilty but we don't we don't have enough evidence of it but we don't have strong evidence that the person is actually innocent also so we leave it somewhere in between so i think in india and many other places we 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 declare the person not guilty that's it or we convict so now coming back to this uh, more more tangible problem so, supposing the existing cure rate is 60%, that is the probability of cure is 0.6. So, a randomly selected person from the population 
will react successfully to the new medication with 60 percent probability. So, supposing 20 patients were selected at random and the new drug was administered with proper procedures. So, x is the number cured. Okay. So, now based on the value of x, can we conclude that the new drug is better than the old one? So, that is the uh, statement. So, actually let p be the cure rate of the new drug. So, what we want to see is, supposing p is the actual, the, the uh, success rate of the new drug, you know, could we have got this x from, from that p? Then, uh, you know, we will we'll, we'll take, we'll take a call on this. So, in view of the guidelines of our uh, hypothesis testing paradigm or the language of hypothesis testing or the framework of hypothesis testing, p is less than or equal to new 6, uh, p, p is less than or equal to 0.6 is the hypothesis that the new drug is not better. We actually want to come out with evidence that the new drug is better. Otherwise, the old drug is there, it is already there in the marketplace, there is nothing substantially better to change over. So, let x denote the number of cures out of 20 in the uh, trial that I have conducted. So, x can take on values 0, 1, 2, up to 20. So, I, I can say something like this, I will if 15 if 15 people out of 20 respond to the new drug, then I will actually assert that the new drug is better than the old drug. Old drug had success rate 60 percent, so this one has better than that. And if it is 14 or less, then I will I will not change over. Okay, so so here my I will conduct a test. So the sample size is in this case 20, and I will test. I mean I will record the number of successes, and that is x. And for for a given p, the number x is a random variable, right? The number x is a random variable for a given p. Depending on the outcome of that random variable measurement, I will I will decide whether to accept or reject the claim. So such a number, such a random variable x is called a test statistic. Okay. So remember that you know I have to specify this procedure up front. I have to say that on this basis I will accept or reject the test. So the test is the the the, the, the new cure is, is administered to 20 people, and I will measure the number of successes. That is a random variable. Depending on the value of that random variable, in this case, one random variable, I will I will have a region where I will accept the hypothesis, the alternate hypothesis, or I will accept the null hypothesis. I mean, basically, either reject the null hypothesis or accept the null hypothesis. That is the way it is it is put. So that that random variable which we define is called the test stati statistic. So now uh, coming to the the type the, the two types of errors that I, I spoke about the decision which is reached by a test it could be wrong. So this is the first thing that you know every statistician or every data analyst or every probabilist or scientist dealing with random phenomenon has to accept and internalize that we could be wrong. So I, you know unlike a deterministic phenomenon where you are either right or wrong, provably so, in, in making a statistical statement we could be right or wrong, we are only trying to put some concrete quantitative bound on, on our errors. So as I said, you, know, you could make a mistake. So the question is what type of mistake and what is the likelihood of that mistake and how much confidence do we have in our assertion. We can run away from the whole thing and say because I am not sure I won't say anything, but that often is not uh, not possible. So we we have to make a make a statement. So for example, in in the light bulb example, supposing we are we are buying equipment for this, I can say that you know I will test each and each and every piece of equipment till its failure and then only I will buy it. Then you know I'll be left with nothing to use. So I will get a I will get a lot of 1,000 light bulbs. I will select 10 of them and I will find out what is their lifetime till till destruction and on that basis I will accept or reject a hypothesis regarding the entire sample. So that seems more practical because you know, so this is this is often the basis for quality control through inspection. 
right so supposing i have to certify that some 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 material that i have purchased is is of the of the desired quality i cannot sample the entire lot i have to sample a part of it and on that basis i have to either accept or reject a lot which 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 claims to come with a certain quality so this is this is in fact a very practical thing which is which is done you know day in and day out so lot of survey sampling so your your trp ratings in advertising your customs inspection procedures your audit principles quality control on shop floors in manufacturing environments quality certification for any any attribute it is based on these principles of you know sampling and coming to some conclusion based on that so what what is being talked about here is is actually very tangible and concrete in an uncertain world right so so the two types of errors is uh, are are as follows one is that the null hypothesis is true but the test says that it should be rejected so we wrongly reject the null hypothesis so this is called type 1 error so this is uh, uh, sort of the more serious one so tests are often designed to control this type 1 error the other type of error is actually that the null hypothesis should be rejected but the test the random outcome of the test says that we should accept it continue to accept it so that is also a mistake so that is called type 2 error so is that okay what what type 1 and type 2 is so here here is the uh, sort of summary so on the the columns are the real state of nature that is h not is true or h not is false which we don't know but those are the two possibilities our actions are on the rows either do not reject h not or reject h not so if if h not is true and we do not reject h not then that is the correct thing to do but if h not is true but we reject h not then then we com commit a wrong which is of type 1 so that is called type 1 error and if h not is false and we but we do not reject it then that is also wrong that is called type 2 error and h not is false and it reject h not that is correct okay so this is the guideline for in a sense defining what is h not and h1 in the first place as i said it it could be done either way so generally speaking falsely rejecting h not that means type 1 error is viewed as a more serious consequence than failing to reject h not when h1 is true so is that okay that is the so in the in the legal analogy falsely convicting somebody who is actually innocent is is considered a a more serious error than declaring a guilty person innocent by mistake okay so that's the so uh, to put some probabilities to it probability of type 1 error is the probability of rejection of h not when h not is actually true so that is called alpha and probability of type 2 error is the probability of not rejecting h not when h1 is actually true that means alternate is actually true but we do not reject the null so that is called beta so generally we we put some bounds on alpha and then try to get the best beta possible you know we 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 don't want alpha to be more than something because you know that is you know a consequence that we don't want to uh, bear so for example we may say the probability of type 1 error should be no more than 5% or, or something like that so a test of the null hypothesis is a course of action specifying the set of values of the random variable test statistic x for which h not is, is to be rejected so for example in our uh, testing for a new new treatment h not was that the probability is less than or equal to 0.6 so we will we will reject it if x is the high value out of 20 if let's say 15 are successful then it seems likely that you know the 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 value of the the value of p is in fact more than 0.6 so we we will reject the null hypothesis and accept it so we we may say we we can say the following for example that we will reject the null hypothesis if x is 15 or higher so that is a possible test that we say so in a given implementation of this test we we take a sample of size 20 draw i mean test i mean t uh, see the outcome of the treatment on those 20 randomly chosen persons record the number x which is the number of successes 
if the number is more than 15, we reject the null hypothesis. So, this is our proposed test. So, we would like to see, so the random variable whose value serves to determine the action is called the test statistic and the region of values, the range of values for which the null hypothesis is rejected is called the rejection region of the test. So, that is just the language used. So, for the example, if, if the null hypothesis is that the probability of success is 0.6 or less and the null alternate is that the treatment is in fact better than the existing one which is uh, 0.6. So, the uh, alternate hypothesis H1 is that P is greater than 0 0.6. We could propose that H0 is rejected if, if X is greater than or equal to 15 and H0 is not rejected if X is less than or equal to 14. So, this is the possible test. So, X is actually a known, known uh, probabilistic uh, random variable. So, it follows a binomial distribution with n equal to 20 and p, the probability of success of an individual trial. So, what is the, what is the type 1 error? So, the type 1 error is the probability of rejecting H naught when H naught is true. So, that means that, so supposing p is 0.6, then what is the chance that I get 15 successes? what is the chance that I get 16 successes or, or more, in that case I will be actually rejecting the, the hypothesis that, uh, P, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the null hypothesis. So, summation from 15 to 20 for P equal to 0 0.6, I choose K sample, I mean I, I, I can get K successes out of 20, so P raised to K and 1 minus P raised to 20 minus K, so those are the failures. So, that quantity is the type 1 error. Is that okay? So, supposing p is 0.6, that means the treatment is no really, not, not really better than, that is the maximum that the, uh, that the null hypothesis is true. So, supposing the treatment is 0.6, but, but by chance I get 15 or more successes, then I will say that actually the, the success rate of the new treatment is better than 0.6 and I will overturn the null hypothesis in, in error. So, let me restate, actually the, the success rate of the new treatment is only 0 0.6, okay. So, roughly speaking 12 out of 20 should be responding favorable to the treatment, but by chance I, I got lucky and I mean uh, lucky or whatever, I, I, I by chance I got 15 or 16 or up to 20 successes. In that case, I would wrongly conclude that the, that the treatment has an effectiveness of more than 0.6 based on this test. So, the chance of that happening, so my test definition is that x, if x is greater than or equal to 15 out of a sample of 20, reject the null hypothesis. So, I could reject the null hypothesis wrongly, which means I put p equal to 0 0.6, compute this binomial expression and This, this quantity tells us that the probability of making a, an error of type 1, is that okay? So, you can, you can just think about it and, and say that this will be some, some quantity between 0 and 1. Hopefully, this quantity should not be too large. That means then, you know, if, if this quantity is, you know, 0.25 or something, then, you know, there is a 25 percent chance that I am making a mistake of type 1, which is, which is a bit uncomfortable. So, normally, the, the language used is that you, you put a level of significance. So, significance level for a hypothesis test is a bound on the type 1 error that you want to con commit, okay. So, it, uh, the, the concept is quite simple, but the way it is put is that significance level alpha is the bound you would like to put on type 1 error for a test, namely the probability of wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. So, let us just look at probability p equal to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So, if, if p is in fact 0 0.3, then you know we, we are very, we are very unlikely to get more than 15 successes. I mean up to 3 decimal point it is 0. But uh, you know with p equal to 0 0.6, we, we actually 
can get 15 or more successes just by chance with, with a 12.6% 12, 12 chance. So if we design a test saying, I will conclude that P less than or equal to 0.6 is, is not true if I get 15 or more successes, then 12.6% of the time, even with 0.6 probability of success, I will actually get 15 or more, more successes. So I will be making a mistake of ty type 1 12.6% of the time. So if we are okay with that, then we can go ahead with that test. So, so do you see the, the, the issue involved in, in, in designing the test? So in, in a hypothesis testing, the, 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 the task of the analyst is to design the test. So here the, de the design of the test is that, let's say I have funds to, to conduct tests on 20 people. So the sample size is given to you, let's say. So now I have to say what is my acceptance region and rejection region. So what is the number of people whose successes I will conclude as rejection region for the null hypothesis and the complement of that will be the acceptance region. Okay? So there is a rejection region. What is the probability that I will be rejecting in error you know, by mistake? So that is alpha which is the type 1 error which if, if the true probability is 0 0.6 then the, the test that we will get 15 or more successes with 0.6 binomial probability is actually uh, not insignificant, it's 12.6 percent. So uh, it's, it's like saying that the, I'm asked to give a recommendation whether the new drug is better or not and actually the new drug is, is just as effective as the existing thing which is 0.6. Based on this test, I will overturn the existing treatment and go for the newer treatment hoping that it's better and I will be wrong 12.6 percent of the time. I mean if this, if this activity is done repeatedly. So that means in error I will be changing my system and you know revamping everything and my norms and my standards and I will do that 12.6 percent of the time. So that is maybe too much of a, I mean if we are uncomfortable with that then we'll say let's not go with 15 or above, let's tighten it up and say 16 or above or 17 and above. So that, that's the type of decision we may, we may say. Or we may say we need a larger sample size because you know the larger the sample the, the more accurately I can, I can pin it down. So I, I hope you got the flavor of it. You have to sit and work it out. It's, it's the, the, the underlying mathematics or the underlying statistical computations are, are actually quite straightforward. It, in this case it's just a binomial probability computation. Of course, for a large sample size and when NP is small, you can, you can do a normal approximation to the binomial and, and, and you know use all the things that you have learned so far. The only new thing is what is the question, what, what, is, the, what is the application uh, of the principle. Uh, so the language of hypothesis testing has to be understood that there is, a, there is a thing called the null hypothesis, there is a thing called the alternate hypothesis, there is a test statistic which is a random variable defined by us. Depending on the value of the random variable, there is a rejection region, there is an acceptance region and there is a chance of committing an error of rejecting the null hypothesis by mistake when it is actually true and that error is called type 1 error and the maximum level of that type 1 error is called the level of significance of the test and so test has to be designed with that in mind. So this is the summary of uh, what I have said so far. A any questions from your side? So in this case the level of significance is 0.126, that means there is a 12.6 percent chance of making a type 1 error. So normally you know we would like to say beforehand what, what should be our type 1 error. So we can set it in advance and then design the test accordingly. So we may say we want to make only a 1 percent error or 5 percent error or 10 percent error of type 1 and uh, so for example 0 0.05 level of significance means that the chance of type 1 error is no more than 5 percent. So I am willing to live with you know 5 percent of the people being hanged by mistake or, or whatever, whatever we are trying to. Uh, the type 2 error is the probability of not rejecting H0 when H1 is true which is similar binomial computation which we can compute for, for this one for, for different values of P. Is that okay? So it is again uh, in this case it is say P is 0.8, actually it is much better than 0.6, okay. But by, by bad luck we get only 12 successes out of 20, 
or, or even less. So, in the way we have defined our test, for any value of p greater than 0.6, we could still get 14 or fewer successes. I mean, we could definitely get 14 or fewer successes with some probability. What is that probability? That is type 2 error. That means, actually the value of p is say 0.7 or a, any, any value like that which is more than 0.6, but our test says you got 14 or fewer successes, so do not, do not overturn the null hypothesis, even though actually it should have been. So, that also is there. So, type 2 error is also there that we could continue to accept the null hypothesis and it is in fact false. So, that type 2 error also can be computed. So, any given test will have a type 1 error and a type 2 error. So, you have to sort of balance out these things. Is that okay? So, normally the first, first criterion for designing a test is a bound on type 1 error and that is called a level of significance. So, that is the first thing. Then if we have any leeway in defining the test, either by increasing the sample size or by redefining the number of successes or whatever we are trying to measure, then we can try for putting a bound on type 2 error. Okay? Normally, we, if we have only one parameter in the, in the test statistic, one random variable in the test statistic, for example, the sample size is given and we just have to decide what is our threshold value for accepting or rejecting, that is the only thing in our control. Then all we can do is put a bound on type 1 error and say that this is a level significance test for level of significance for this test. And we can say that there is a resulting type 2 error, we cannot do anything about it, but we have controlled the type 1 error. Is that okay? So, in this example, for a given x, I mean for, for a given level like 15, for, for a given p, you can, you can compute the type 2 error and uh, you have to live with that, that is it. There is another term used called the power of a test, which is 1 minus type 2 probability of type 2 error. Uh, this is another term that is used, which is the probability that the test will reject H0 when H1 is actually true. And uh, it is in this sense that the, uh, that means we are doing the right thing, we are doing the right thing in rejecting H0 when, when H1 is actually true. So, that is called the power of the test. So, the, the one of those four boxes, so H1 is actually true and we actually reject H0. So, this uh, bottom right entry in in this table of 4, that is H0 is false, that means H1 is true and we reject H0. So, that probability of that of that happening is, is called the power of the test. So, it is 1 minus, given H0 is false, two things can happen, either we reject H0 or we do not reject H0. The probability that we reject H0 is called type 2 error beta, 1 minus that is called the power of the test. So, we would look for a test with high power. So, this is the same thing, this is what I had said earlier. So, in our example, for, for, for different values of p, we can, we can talk of the power of the test. So, for example, p equal to 0.8, the power of the test is 0 0.804. For p equal to 0 0.9, the power of the test is 0.989. That means, for, for p equal to point, 0.8, the test will rightly throw out the null hypothesis. It should, because the, the, the probability is actually greater than 0.6. In fact, it is 0.8 it should throw out the null hypothesis, it will do that 80 percent of the time. At, at p equal to 0.9, which is significantly more than 0.6, it will throw out the null hypothesis 0 0.989 percent of the time. This particular test, which is rejecting the null hypothesis and x is greater than or equal to 15. So, every test will have some power. So, you know, we can, we can define different rejection regions. We can say, I will, I will throw out the null hypothesis. Null hypothesis p is less than or equal to 0.6. That is the null hypothesis. I will throw it out when my test statistic is greater than 15 or 18 or 14. So, each, each rejection region will, will have different power. I mean, will different, will, will have different type 1 and type 2 errors, different power also. So, we just have to select the right one. So, to follow up, uh, you can, you can just, uh, read chapter 8 of, of the textbook and uh, of course these. So, the material is very standard. So, unless you put pen to paper and try to just follow the uh, examples given in the book, there are enough solved examples in the book and you know it, one or two of these problems will be taken up for, for tutorial uh, sessions. So, the, the material is very standard. So, only you have to 
just get familiar with the terminology of this this uh, this topic which is actually a, a fairly useful one i mean it's a it's got an interesting history of uh, how how people have tried to uh, formalize uncertainty and uh, it it is it is practically useful in in several domains and uh, if you, if you look up any experimental uh, research work reported you will see level of significance reports of statistical i mean of any experimental data that you, you will see such terms being used you know uh, uh, we can certify something up to some level of significance which means they are putting a bound on the type 1 error so in in um, statistical quality control certification uh, sampling uh, survey marketing you know anything where you are relying on for example sampling from a small set of data or where you are uh, uh, doing experiments which are subject to uncertainty you have to make some statements and this is one of the standard ways of making it so it is it is worth knowing about this from a uh, purely practical point of view it will help you understand what is the way people talk about uncertainty in a in a in a formal way okay so just uh, two two small things to to wind up one is that at least in the quality control type of literature where you are you are supposed to inspect and uh, the thing the uh, the the term oc is used operating characteristic that is a curve i mean that just a plot of so in this case for example p is the probability of success of that treatment i plot that on the x axis and i plot the probability of accepting the hypothesis so that is called the operating characteristic and one minus that is the power of the test so that that term oc is used so that will be some um, so in this case as p increases my probability of accepting the null hypothesis decreases so it will you can you can easily see that this uh, this function b is some decrease